Hello and welcome to our first issue of DVD RV Travel, a video RV travel magazine. My name is Steve Gibbs. My wife Gloria and I travel full time in our bus conversion to produce our magazine. Come join us inside at the Edney Bay where Steve will show you how he produces DVD movies on a laptop computer. Welcome to my Edney Bay. For those interested in how I produce DVD RV travel and our travel videos, let's review the hardware and software. First, I use a Canon GL2 3 chip mini DV camcorder to record our travels. This camera has a great lens with optical image stabilization. That is an important feature to me since we try to do as much work as possible without a tripod. I also have a JVC mini DV camcorder that I use when I need to travel lighter or when the camera could get wet or abused. Gloria uses an Olympus C740 digital camera to take still shots while I'm filming. I'll use these still shots when I need something that I wasn't able to capture on film. Mini DV camcorders connect directly to the computer by a FireWire interface so no video capture card is required. I use Uliad Media Studio Pro to capture and edit video and you lead DVD Movie Factory 2 to create DVDs from the final project file. For the travelogue episodes on our website, I use Windows Media Encoder to create streaming Windows Media files suitable for download off the website. In this issue of DVD RV Travel, we'll take a train ride on the Canyon City and Royal Gorge Railroad through the Grand Canyon of the Arkansas in Colorado. Then we'll unhitch the toad to see part of Mammoth Cave National Park that most people miss. Along I-75 in southern Ohio, we'll get off the interstate and visit Trader's World Flea Market. Riverview RV Park in Valdalia, Louisiana makes a great stopping spot when visiting Natchez, Mississippi, and we'll show you why. Finally, we'll take a short trip along the Natchez Trace Parkway, which travels from Nashville to Natchez. This is a great RV trip. During our first feature, we'll take you for a ride through Colorado's Royal Gorge on the Royal Gorge Route Railroad. This two-hour trip is not just another train ride. It travels along one of the most scenic routes in the world through what has been called the Grand Canyon of the Arkansas. Passenger services through the Royal Gorge began in 1880 with the completion of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad route from Canyon City to Leadville. In 1967, the last passenger service ended and in 1996, the Union Pacific, having absorbed the DNRGW through mergers, ended freight service and abandoned the Tennessee Pass line which included this section of track through the gorge. Recognizing the historical significance of this route to gold and silver mining in Colorado, the state stepped in to preserve this section passing through the gorge. Eventually, 12 miles of track between Canyon City and Parkdale were purchased from the Union Pacific in 1998. Finally, after 32 years, passengers would once again experience passing through the gorge by train.
As we travel along the Arkansas River out of Canyon City, the canyon walls begin to close in on the river. The Royal Gorge is about four miles long and almost 1,100 feet deep. The Arkansas has spent about five million years cutting out this obstruction to its march towards the Mississippi River. This area was first explored by Zeblin Pike in 1806. Pike was sent by General James Wilkinson to explore the southwestern portion of the Louisiana Purchase. At the time, President Jefferson believed that Lewis and Clark, along with the rest of the Corps of Discovery, had perished somewhere between North Dakota and the Pacific Ocean. Since 1929, the Royal Gorge Bridge has been one of Colorado's most famous attractions. At 1,053 feet high above the river, it's considered the highest suspension bridge in the world. On any day with even a slight breeze, you can feel it sway as you walk across its 1,260 foot span. If that experience fails to provide an adequate thrill, then take a ride in the cable car that also travels across the gorge. There are several ways to travel on the Royal Gorge route. The first class cars feature table seating, appetizers, and a glass of champagne or sparkling cider. Coach class provides seating in the enclosed coach cars. Both allow access to the open air observation cars where, if the weather is nice, you'll probably spend most of your time anyway. Food can be purchased in the Fremont concession car and alcoholic beverages can be purchased and enjoyed in the Sunshine Falls bar car. For real train buffs, a ticket can be purchased that allows you to ride up front with the engineer. At Parkdale, about 12 miles from Canyon City, the train stops so the crew can transfer from the twin diesel locomotives that pulled the train up the gorge to the single diesel on the rear of the train that will pull it back. In 1999, a 500-acre rock quarry was opened here, and stone is now shipped by rail at night back through Canyon City to Pueblo, thus reinstating freight service along the route as well.
gorge is so narrow that at one point there was simply no room to carve out a track bed. Thus, the construction of a unique hanging bridge was required to suspend the railroad over and parallel to the river. Since 1880, passenger trains have stopped here to let passengers walk along the bridge and view the gorge. Join us now for a toad trip through the backcountry at Mammoth Cave National Park. Besides the well-known cave tours, Mammoth Cave National Park also has 53,000 acres above ground. The park features many miles of hiking trails and roads to explore this other face of Mammoth. After setting up camp at the National Park Campground, we unhitched our toad from the motorhome and set out to circle the park, explore old cemeteries and homesteads, and make two ferry crossings. By traveling Green River Ferry Road, to Ollie Road, to Hutchison Ferry Road, to Brownsville Road, we were able to travel in a loop back to the campground near the visitor center. Including several stops, this 28-mile loop took us just over two hours to complete.
At Hodgkins Ferry, we discovered a disabled vehicle had the passage blocked. Fortunately, our tracker was able to tow him off so that we did not need to retrace over three quarters of our route back to the Green River Ferry. Our off-the-interstate stop is Trader's World, located north of Cincinnati, Ohio, at I-75 exit 29. Here we'll visit one of the largest flea markets in the U.S. This is a great RV stop because you can park your rig in the RV parking area, which includes electric and water service. Leave the air conditioning going and you can return to a cool RV for lunch. After paying a whopping 75 cents per person admission fee, you can spend all day shopping. Unfortunately, Trader's World does not allow RVs to remain overnight. With over 10 interconnected buildings, this place is so big you'll need a plan in order to see it all. First take your FRS talk about radios in order to cover more territory. If you don't have radios, establish a meeting time and place to check in with kids and spouses. Start from the outside, then enter the indoor area at one end and work your way through each of the buildings consecutively. Trader's World is open Saturday and Sundays all year. Even if you're not all that interested in shopping, there are over 100 signs and interesting displays located throughout the various buildings. And what would a flea market be without product demonstrations? Let's listen to a couple of them now. You can walk right up your car, maybe with uh, uh, a couple weeks dirt, just normal dirt on it, and say hello to her. You just scratch it out on the top of your just like that. Now, before and wipe that, I'm going to show you why you're going to be scratches. There's so always little foul droplets of polymer there. That picks your dirt right up off the surface, puts a barrier between your dirt and your paint, and your dirt never touches your paint again. If you do have feather scratch, that use it so healthy. Now the great thing about this is that there's no soap in there, no bleach, no harmful chemicals. So it's safe around your children, safe around your pets, and safe on all fabric. Now if you're throwing one room, a couch or a chair, or your car inside and out, you need to have a bucket this size. Off the water, off the brush. All you want is that foam off the top. Work that foam down into your carpet real good. The more dirty the carpet, the more foam you want to use. Not like mopping that kitchen floor, you want to work it down in there. What this is, is not a magic trick. The dirt just doesn't disappear. This is a dry cleaning process made by DuPont. And because this is safe, you can use this on a Haitian cotton, a silk or oriental. It takes the dirt, separates the dirt from the carpet, and it traps, and it locks it in that foam. That's what they call soil suspension. Now, I'm no way of trying to tell you that when it rains that you're going to get water spots, you will. Take a cloth, damp on one side, go like that, turn it over to the dry side, the spots are gone. That's been on since 10 o'clock. Just when you clean it up, you'll see how easy it comes out. If you uh, miss a spot, you see it a month later, it still comes off the same way.
Trader's World also features entertainment and a food service area. And if all of this is not enough to satisfy your shopping urge, Turtle Creek Flea Market, about two-thirds the size of Trader's World, is located on the other side of the interstate at the same exit. Our featured stopping spot is Riverview RV Park in Vidalia, Louisiana, located just across the Mississippi River from historic Natchez, Mississippi. Riverview makes a great base to visit Natchez, America's antebellum home museum, and to explore the lower section of the Natchez Trace Parkway. Featuring full hookup, level pull-through RV sites along the Mississippi River, this park also offers free high-speed internet service in the comfort of the recreation lounge of the main guest building, as well as in the large laundry room. A well-maintained pool offers refreshing swims after touring the historic mansions on hot summer days. And for groups, rallies and RV caravans. A separate enclosed group activities building provides shelter from the elements for potlucks, meetings, and other social activities. During the second travel feature of this issue of DVD RV Travel, we'll take you on an abbreviated trip along the Natchez Trace Parkway. The following segment is a sample of our full feature video, Traveling the Devil's Backbone, which is available from the Travel Videos section of our website. The Trace is old, very old. At first it was a simple path beaten through the bush by the Native Americans and buffalo herds. For several thousand years it connected hunting grounds, salt licks, rivers, and streams to allow hunting and trading between the various tribes that occupied large villages and mound cities. The trail was well worn when Hernando de Soto traveled it in 1540 seeking the elusive Northwest Passage, an all-water route across the continent of North America. The trail brought his demise, just as it would to the explorer that later discovered there would be no such route. By 1789, the settlers of what was then the western frontier along the Ohio and Cumberland rivers began seeking new, more favorable markets for their goods. The Mississippi River gave them access to the Southwest Territories and the seaport of New Orleans. These settlers, or cane tucks as they were called by the people of Natchez and New Orleans, would build flatboats to float their goods down the river. Since these boats could not be navigated upstream against the current, they would be sold for lumber at the end of the trip. They were then faced with a 500 mile walk home. During this time, the trace also served as a post rider route, providing mail service between Nashville and the new Southwest Territories, attained with the Louisiana Purchase. Traffic was so heavy on the trace that an extensive series of inns or stands soon appeared. They were spaced about one day's foot travel along the road. For about 25 cents, a traveler could get a meal and stay the night. In 1811, the steamboat New Orleans made its way from Pittsburgh down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. However, even more remarkable, it returned back up the Mississippi against the current and thus ending one-way travel on this mighty river. Steamboats would soon make the flatboat and the long walk home unnecessary. By 1909, much of the trace was forgotten. The Daughters of the American Revolution long sought to preserve this historical route. They began by placing a stone monument in Natchez marking its beginning, and by 1920 had placed about a dozen such markers along the old route. During the 1930s, public works projects were used to keep Americans working. Building a road or parkway to help preserve the old road had been proposed for many years. In 1934, Congressman Busby of Mississippi introduced the first legislation to fund such a project. Construction of the National Parkway began in 1937 and still continues today. 
The goal of this project was to purchase land surrounding the remains of the old road that could be identified and then preserve them. Today, this National Parkway travels through Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. Its northern terminus is just south of Nashville, and the temporary southern terminus is just north of Natchez. The parkway is over 450 miles of two-lane paved road with a maximum speed limit of 50 miles per hour. No commercial traffic is allowed on the parkway, and almost all major crossroads pass above or below the parkway grade. Truly an RVer's dream road. Plenty of parking at just about every point of interest provides big rig access, and those areas not RV friendly are clearly marked. A milepost system is used so you can easily track your progress. The Parkway brochure references all services and points of interest to the milepost. And speaking of points of interest, there are over 114 places to hike, picnic, explore the old trace, study the history, and enjoy this undiscovered national treasure. At milepost 404, you'll find Jackson Falls. Here, Jackson Branch departs its original stream bed and plunges down over the bluffs towards the Duck River in the valley below. Take a short walk on a 900-foot paved trail to the base of a small but interesting waterfall along Jackson Branch. Although the trail is steep, there are not many steps and the trip will be worth the walk. The falls are named in honor of President Andrew Jackson. As a general of the Tennessee Militia, he traveled the trace on several military expeditions and on one very special personal trip, returning from Springfield Plantation in Mississippi with his new bride, Rachel. Also an excellent picnic spot, Jackson Falls offers another short but more challenging hike up to Baker's Bluff for a beautiful view of the Duck River Valley, almost 300 feet below. At milepost 330 sits one of our favorite hikes, the trail to Rock Spring. A fine gravel trail leads over a crossing of Colbert Creek and then along Rock Creek to its source at Rock Spring. At many places along the trail, signs point out unique features of the forest in this area. The return loop is a very pleasant walk through the woods back to the Colbert Creek crossing. Well, here we are at Rock Spring. This is uh, just inside the Alabama state line. We're just about to the Tennessee River. Rock Spring right here, is, all this water is flowing out of here and forms Rock Creek, which rolls into the Colbert Creek, which joins the Tennessee River just a very short distance from here. Today it's only about 70, so it's not as quite as warm as it would be down here, so the water does seem a little chilly, but it still feels good after a short 20-minute walk to get back in here. Over the years, we have talked to a number of people who have traveled the whole parkway from Nashville to Natchez and said, there isn't anything to see there. It's true that if you simply whisk along in your RV, you'll miss a lot. Cypress Swamp at milepost 122 certainly is an example of this. From the road, you would never guess that a wetland featuring bald cypress and water tupelo trees is within an easy walk. The combination boardwalk and gravel trail lead you on a 20-minute loop walk through this intriguing area.
Walking north on the trace, Mount Locust at mile post 15 was the first stander end that a traveler would reach. This would have been a welcome sight to a weary traveler. Let's go in and learn more from a park service ranger with a very special connection to this house. Well, folks, welcome to uh, Mount Locust. I'm uh, Ranger Rick Chamberlain. The uh, center room of Mount Locust was the first room built in 1779. None of the furniture, the antiques, or the artifacts are original to Mount Locust, but they are authentic to the year 1810-1820. Everything is either a reproduction or an antique. The center room of Mount Locust served as a bar or a tap room for the travelers traveling up the trace. As you know, these were the boatmen or the cane tucks walking or riding horses from Natchez to Nashville. The old Natchez trace passed right in front of the house. They'd be given uh, cornmeal mush and a piece of cornbread and a glass of milk when they got here in the same mess for the morning. Probably charged about a quarter of uh, Spanish gold, which in, in 1810 was 25 or 30 dollars for two meals and a place to sleep. They were allowed to sleep on the back porch or out in the backyard. By 1799, they must be doing pretty good because they built a two-story dormitory in the backyard called Sleeping Hall. Two floors, wall to wall, corn shug mattresses. You just came in, grabbed the mattress, and laid down next to another trailer, kind of like a flop house. By 1810, they keep the wife, had 11 children in the house. Had room on the end for the boys, one behind it for the girls, rest of them in the nursery. Three bedrooms for the kids. Uh, those are rope beds, they are corn shucks. Or, or, you know, corn shuck mattresses and they are high off the floor because they had trundle bed that slid out at night from the sleeping space. The um, Park Service designated the National Trace of the National Park in 1937. They started buying land in the domain from Nashville to Nashville. Here at Mount Locust, they bought almost, well, they bought 70 acres from my grandmother in 1937. And she moved back behind the cemetery and built her home, and that's where I live today. Um, but the family lived here, my family lived here from 1779 to 1944, five generations of the family. I was born in the room on the end in 1940. My father was born in that room, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. I was built with my great-great-grandfather, and my great-great-great-grandmother lived here and shared the, the girls' room with our granddaughters. We lived here from 1779 to 1944. As you walk the grounds of Mount Locust, we're sure you'll agree this is the crown jewel of many fine jewels along this national treasure, the Natchez Trace Parkway. We hope that you have enjoyed this issue of DVD RV Travel. For more information about the destinations featured, we suggest you visit these websites. The Royal Gorge Route Railroad site includes a complete timetable and fare schedule to help you in purchasing tickets on this great train ride. The MPS.gov site features all of the national parks, including Mammoth Cave and Natchez Trace Parkway. Visit Riverview's site for more information on this great RV park and things to do in the Natchez area. And of course, visit our website for more on our travel videos, travel logs, bus conversion information, and RV travel seminars.